Hello. Today I'd like to briefly discuss some of the problems with the case against Bruno Richard Hauptman um, in the Lindbergh kidnapping trial. There have been a number of books written about the case over the years and a number of different theories advanced that suggest that Bruno Hauptman may have actually been innocent of the crime and wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death uh, when he, in fact, did not kidnap and murder the Lindbergh baby. So I just want to talk about some of this evidence briefly and let you draw your own conclusions. So a lot of the evidence of Hauptman's innocence actually came to light in the 1980s due to an investigation that was conducted um, by a researcher named Ludovic Kennedy. And he investigated the case rather extensively and wrote a book about his findings. So a lot of the evidence that he found suggested the possibility that Hauptman may have been innocent of the crime. Uh, first off, Bruno Hauptman always maintained that he was innocent and that he had no knowledge whatsoever of who abducted the Lindbergh child and who murdered the Lindbergh child. Uh, he was found to have the ransom money in his possession, but Hauptman claimed that the ransom money was actually given to him by a friend named Isidore Fish, that Fish had been a friend and a business partner of Hauptman's and that Fish had gone on a European vacation and left several belongings with Hauptman for safekeeping uh, while Fish was on vacation. However, Fish went to Europe and subsequently died uh, while he was in Europe. And so Hauptman, finding out about the death of his friend, went through Fish's belongings and discovered this box of money, which turned out to be the Lindbergh ransom money. And according to Hauptman, Fish owed him a debt. They had been business partners, and Hauptman was having some financial difficulties at that point in time. And so he just decided, what the hell, just go ahead and spend the money. But he claims that he had no knowledge of how Fish got the money. And he did not realize that it was the uh, Lindbergh ransom money. So this story was the crux of Hauptman's defense in terms of how he came in possession of the money. Um, but Kennedy and his investigation did find out that, that Isidore Fish person, we know that Fish existed and that he did, in fact, go to Europe and he did die in Europe. And we know that he was friends with Hauptman. Whether or not he left these possessions with Hauptman, we don't know, but at least we can corroborate some aspects of, uh, of Bruno Hauptman's story. Um, Kennedy also pointed out in his investigation that the public was absolutely outraged about the circumstances of the crime. Here, Lindbergh was an American hero, and you have this German immigrant carpenter abduct and murder Lindbergh's firstborn child. Uh, keep in mind, too, that this is just after World War I, so there was a lot of hatred towards Germany at that point in time. So you had just a situation that was absolutely explosive in the sense that you have an American hero and his baby, and then this crime committed against him by a German. So this factored into the public's need for retribution and blood, and they definitely wanted to see someone hang for this crime, and Hauptman was the perfect scapegoat in that respect. Uh, Kennedy also found problems with some of the other evidence. He found that one of the witnesses that testified against Hauptman at the trial, a man who claimed he saw Hauptman near the Lindbergh estate, that this gentleman was actually 87 years old and almost completely blind. There was another witness that also testified that he saw Hauptman loitering near the Lindbergh estate. According to Kennedy's investigation, this guy was just trying to collect reward money and was, in fact, given money by the prosecution as a reward when he identified Bruno Richard Hauptman in a lineup at police headquarters. Dr. Condon 
was perhaps one of the most important witnesses in the trial of Bruno Richard Hauptman, and he identified Hauptman as being Cemetery John. Now, remember, Dr. Condon was the liaison. He was the go-between between between the Lindbergh family and the kidnappers. He was the gentleman that came forward and volunteered his services, volunteered to help the Lindbergh family get the baby back. He was subsequently contacted by the kidnappers and authorized to be a go-between. And so he took the ransom money and delivered it to a man in a cemetery in the Bronx. And the man told him his name was John. And he became known in the press as Cemetery John. Well, Condon identified Bruno Richard Hauptman as Cemetery John during the trial. However, Kennedy found out in his investigation that when Condon went to the police department to view a lineup of suspects and to be introduced to Bruno Richard Hauptman, that he couldn't identify Hauptman as John. In fact, he told the police that he did not think that this man was Cemetery John. However, at the time of the trial, then he changed his story and identified Hauptman uh, as being Cemetery John. But in the interim, Condon became aware of the other evidence that Hauptman was involved in the kidnapping And so possibly that influenced his thinking and made him think, you know what, maybe this is the correct guy. Another problem that uh, Kennedy identified in his investigation was Lindbergh's identification of Hauptman's voice. So Charles Lindbergh himself testified at the trial that Bruno Richard Hauptman's voice matched the voice that he had heard in the cemetery two years earlier. So remember, Lindbergh accompanied Dr. Condon to the cemetery to deliver the money. Now, Lindbergh did not see Cemetery John, but he did hear him speak. He heard him speak two words, hey, doctor, and a thick German accent. And so Lindbergh identified Hauptman's voice as the same voice that he heard in the cemetery. But Kennedy argued that this is very questionable because Lindbergh made this identification two years after the fact, and again, on only the basis of these two words, hey, doctor. Also, Lindbergh had been told about Hauptman being in possession of the ransom money, had been told that the wood from the ladder matched the wood in Hauptman's attic, had been told about some of the other evidence. So again, you have to wonder how credible Lindbergh's identification really was. Some other problems Kennedy identified, uh, he found out that some newspaper reporters actually admitted that they had written Dr. Condon's phone number in Bruno Richard Hauptman's attic after Hauptman had been arrested, and that they planted evidence basically to come up with a story that they could write on and they could report on for their newspaper. So clearly, this key piece of evidence that was used to connect Bruno Richard Hauptman to Dr. Condon was shown to be a complete fabrication, according to uh, Ludovic Kennedy's investigation. Kennedy also found out that there were some experts that testified at the trial about the fact that the wood in Hauptman's attic did not, in fact, match the wood that was in the ladder that was recovered at the Lindbergh estate. Um, And there was also evidence that the wood might have been tampered with. And Kennedy asserts that it's possible the police themselves tampered with the wood in Hauptman's attic and distorted it to make it match the wood in the ladder because the police were actually in Hauptman's apartment for several months uh, collecting evidence. So it's possible they could have manufactured this evidence. And also Kennedy argued that it didn't make sense that Hauptman would go into his attic and cut a piece of floorboard to use in the construction of the ladder because there was actually a great deal of lumber found in Hauptman's garage, which was downstairs. So if he had this excess lumber, why didn't he just use that to finish the ladder? So that seemed questionable. Uh, Kennedy also argues that the handwriting analysis itself was questionable. So there were two handwriting experts that testified that the handwriting on the Lindbergh ransom notes matched Bruno Richard Hauptman's handwriting 
uh, when he did some forced dictations for the police. However, Kennedy asserts that the handwriting experts, the two handwriting experts that made this connection, were actually incorrect in some later cases that they gave testimony about. And so if they were wrong in other cases, how do we know that what they were saying was correct in the Lindbergh case? You know, how valid are, is their testimony uh, and how are they really stacking up as handwriting experts if they gave incorrect testimony in other cases? Uh, Kennedy also found some records that showed that Hauptman was, in fact, at work at the time of the abduction. So Hauptman claimed he had an alibi. He claimed he was working when the Lindbergh baby was abducted. And Kennedy argues that he found some records that did show uh, that Hauptman was on the payroll of this company and that he was employed. Now, the prosecution contended that these records were fabricated and that they were tampered with. So I think this is a controversial point uh, as to the accuracy or the validity of these records. And finally, Kennedy argues that the autopsy on the Lindbergh baby was very poorly conducted, that it was done by the funeral home director who was not a professional medical examiner, and that uh, this gentleman actually had arthritis that caused his hands to shake. So the possibility is that he didn't do a very good autopsy. And for that reason, we can't say for sure how exactly the Lindbergh child died. And if we can't say that, then we can't prove murder. So again, this is a very controversial point because could we really convict Hauptman of murder if we can't prove that a murder took place? Forgetting all the other evidence. So ultimately, it was impossible to say how the baby really died, according to Ludovic Kennedy's investigation. So anyway, these are just some of the points that Kennedy made, uh, asserting that there were some problems with the investigation and trial and suggesting the possibility that Bruno Hauptman was, in fact, innocent and was wrongfully convicted of the crime. Uh, ultimately, it's one of those things that I just don't think we'll really ever know the true answer to. Uh, there certainly is evidence on both sides of the case, um, but these are some of the main factors that people point to uh, in terms of evidence for Haldeman's guilt or innocence. So anyway, that about wraps it up for the discussion. Uh, if you have any questions about this, I encourage you to send me an email and also just let me know. I'd be curious to know what you think uh, if Hauptman was, in fact, uh, innocent of the crime or if you think he was guilty. But that about wraps it up for the Hauptman discussion.